Now we move to the third speaker of um, our hearing today, and that is Mr. Kim Jolliffe, um, independent researcher on security development and humanitarian affairs in Myanmar. Uh, he's an, an independent uh, researcher, writer and trainer who works for peace, ethnic equality um, and an end to the military rule in Myanmar. Um, Mr. Jolliffe has worked in the region since 2007, mostly in conflict affected areas in Myanmar and with refugee and migrant communities on its borders. He's written uh, policy guidance, he has provided training and he has assisted programs for local civil society resistance organizations and community based groups. UN, UN and other intergovernmental bodies, international NGOs, research institutions, security think tanks and analysis firms. So uh, he has published widely and uh, you can uh, study all that on his website. So um, uh, Mr. Kim Jolliffe, please take the floor and, and give your statement to our inquiry. Sure, thank, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'll jump, jump straight in. And I think, you know, the key points that I hope to start with and, and end with are, there are four, four things that should not be in doubt by now. Um, the first is that the military hunter is, is losing um, and that the federal democracy movement can succeed. The second is that this would by far be the best scenario for ending decades of human rights abuse and overcoming the ongoing genocide against the Rohingya, in addition to a much wider array of patterns of, of violence and oppression. Number three is that this would also be by far the best scenario for regional security and economic development and for the interests of ASEAN states and India, China, Japan, and, and other key stakeholders in the region. And fourthly, the fourth thing that should not be in doubt is that democracies around the world and in the region can act decisively to make this a certainty. Um, and again, we're not talking about a black and white who will win, who won't win, but we're talking about how much can this transition bring about the change that the people deserve. So there's no doubt that there's plenty that democracies around the world and in the region can do to make the outcomes as, as best as possible, um, and they have very little to lose. So I'll try and focus on the fourth one and some of the practical points, but I just want to make some of the first three points a little clearer first. So first of all, the military is losing. Um, the trajectory of this conflict and the trajectory of change is what we have to pay attention to. The military's losses have increased every single month since last September when the NUG declared its defensive war. And as someone who studied conflict in the country for about 13 years or approaching a year longer, you know, the kinds of this level of pressure on the military in terms of its forces, its logistical integrity, its command integrity, its facilities, its communication capacity, and basically any other measure. It's completely unprecedented. The military has not been very successful at any time in the last few decades at actually defeating any of the ethnic resistance organizations, and they have always given it a hard time. But even then, you know, attacks on large convoys where dozens of Myanmar troops were killed were very, very rare. Attacks on military facilities and bases are even, were even rarer. We're now seeing those every single day all over the country. 
there's only about 25% of townships in the country left that are not a, uh, an area where the military is facing sustained pressure. That doesn't mean there's a clear path. It doesn't mean that it's all going to move firmly in one direction. And of course, it doesn't mean, it doesn't make any of the humanitarian challenges go away. But the trajectory of change is what we have to look at. And if analysis firms or other independent analyses that people were listening to six months ago, a year ago, barely gave the idea that the Tamador could lose any space on their pages, that we should now be at a point where that scenario is firmly in all of our analysis as one of the main major scenarios. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's definitely the trajectory happening at the moment. More broadly, the country is undergoing a revolution of the spirit alongside this, this resistance movement. The hardcore NLD supporters alongside civil servants who, you know, from families that have worked in the state for generations, also alongside ethnic resistance organizations and their movements, plus huge engagement from civil society, including women and youth groups. All of this is not just happening in a corner somewhere um, between some like-minded individuals. This is happening online. This is part of the whole country is participating in this and it's having huge impacts on the mentality, on the way that people talk about politics, the way people think about politics. And so issues like the Rohingya, uh, women's rights, the way that they see the ethnic resistance organizations, all of these things is completely transformed. And I'm talking to people every single day that are confirming that as well as what we see online. So the second, the second and third points are that well, there should be no doubt in our minds that the military losing and ethnic um, and other resistance movements succeeding and forming a federal democracy movement, this should be seen as, as, the, um, as an absolute win. Um, first of all, from a rights-based perspective, the military really has been at the core of the country's problems. I think in the modern world, we, we, we're kind of past seeing black and white villains and superheroes. You know, politics is always more complicated. There's always, there's never really goodies and baddies. But we're now looking at a context where it's about as close to that as you could possibly imagine. There really is one institution at the heart of all of this pain and suffering. There really is one institution that has been leading the genocide, that has been the primary source of division and hatred in the country, and that has been driving the ethnic conflict, and that has been blocking democracy and progress on things like women's rights. It's a country where even in the previous constitutional era, women could be sexually assaulted both by soldiers or by their own husbands without any legal ramifications whatsoever under the law. Time and time and time again, civil society organizations and democratic political parties have tried to change those laws and were systematically blocked again and again and again. And the reason for this is not just a cultural thing or just something that's going to be there anyway, even if the military is not there. It really is, has been driven by this institution and increasingly that institution's alliance with Buddhist extremists that have interests in driving this kind of hatred and this kind of divisive politics. The military has five universities of its own. It's like an echo chamber. It raises people, it raises its own intellectuals who then go on to do master's degrees once they're colonels, who study the master's degrees of their predecessors. There's an echo chamber and they have a very strong inst institutional culture of their own that is based on an extremely chauvinistic um, set of doctrines and policies, both in terms of the violence they use against, against civilians, but also in terms of the 
the kind of extremist Buddhist ideology that underpins it, where battalion commanders have to be Buddhists and they and their wives have to participate in Buddhist rituals in certain ways. All of these things that are part of the culture are really at the source of this specific institution. And then the lower ranks are put through extreme hazing rituals and abuse and indoctrination to be brought into that world where they're taught, you do what your boss tells you, and that's all you need to know. And the other thing is that all of these people around you, you cannot trust them because they know that you're more powerful than them. And they know, and you know that you, they would kill you if they had the chance. And the military are drilled with this kind of ideology from a very young age, including child soldiers and other young people who've been recruited. So you have this extremely detached and perverse institution that has blossomed or ballooned into this kind of extremely powerful institution that controls much of the economy and big parts of the government. We should not be under any illusions that that is the source of these problems. It's also a major block on Myanmar's economic potential, on the potential for Myanmar to be a cooperative partner in the region. Issues like migration, the refugee crisis, the boat people who const periodically flee into the seas, the fact that COVID-19 and the Delta variant of the, um, you know, ultimately burst out of Myanmar into Thailand, despite very serious efforts actually on the part of the EROs who are both here today to police that border and stop people coming across. The fight against drug resistant malaria, which causes a global threat if it spreads further, all of these issues are of really serious regional concern. Allowing this coup to continue and this junta to maintain power makes all of these things much more difficult to manage, not to mention the $60 billion meth trade, which is centered in Myanmar from militia controlled areas that are under junta command. All of these issues have serious regional ramifications. This is the chance to deal with the root cause of those problems. So based on that rationale, there's a huge amount that democracies around the world and the countries in the region can do to make a decisive difference to the way that this develops from here on out. And absolutely central to those, to those efforts are two things, direct support and engagement for the NUG and the ethnic resistance organizations, directly working with their civilian wings, empower them, fund them, help them maneuver, help them to build an even bigger coalition to bring more actors on board to strengthen this core of territories that is emerging that represents democracy and is trying to build a federal country without the military junta. Support the NUCC to become a body that is recognized and that eventually so that an interim and then a transitional constitution can be in place that could be recognized internationally so that this core of actors at the center of this process can become the, the bearers of the state's responsibilities and the state's duties and the state's rights. And central to this is not just direct support between bilateral support. This has to come through ASEAN and through Thailand. So advocacy within ASEAN, within the region, and to Thailand is absolutely critical. To allow more space um, for these actors to operate, to allow more cross-border assistance and more maneuverability along the borders. This is absolutely critical. And also a kind of symbolic weight of recognition is critical. It's very, very important that signals are given from the international community that this set of stakeholders are increasingly seen as the legitimate authorities and the legitimate representatives of the Myanmar people. This symbolic gesture has real weight in the region and in the country. 
And within the country, that's to the public. So the public see that their chosen leaders are the ones that have recognition. That has huge weight to business sector, to religious sector, to other very powerful institutions in the country that don't necessarily take sides, but will drift in favor of whoever they see as the legitimate authorities. It also has huge weight for actors like China, India, and other regional states who frankly don't have huge alliances with the military junta themselves, but take a policy of recognizing whoever is seen as in control. And let me tell you, the Myanmar junta does not have effective control of the country. It controls the downtown areas of major cities. It controls the banks. It controls the airports. It controls most of the seaports. And it controls the visa processes. So those most conspicuous areas obviously lead them to be seen as the de facto authorities. But in terms of education, in terms of preventing COVID-19, in terms of managing borders, of which they control a very small percentage, in terms of managing illegal wildlife trade, of cracking down on the illegal narcotics trade, in terms of providing aid to the public, in terms of reopening schools, in terms of all of these other major functions of the state, the junta does not have effective control. The junta has extremely limited and extremely controversial control over some elements of those areas. So it's very, very important that legitimacy is sways the other way too, so that the actors who do represent the people, the actors who are trying their best to build a new system that's based on inclusion, that's based on peace, that's based on justice, and frankly, the actors who are not burning people every day. I make that point because we need to make a very clear separation about who is, what types of tactics different actors are using in this conflict. We should not be under the illusion that this is a civil war with two sides, both sides are using violence and so on. There is a very clear difference in the types of violence being used by one side versus the other side. So let's give recognition to that. I'm going to finish up, but just to say again, let's give recognition to who sheltered and protected thousands of democracy activists from day one of the coup, before the political alliances had even formed, before there was this kind of political agenda to form the Federal Democracy Charter. Who was protecting those activists? Who was screening them for COVID and putting through them through quarantine while the junta started shooting protesters in the head? All of these factors need to be taken into account to make a very clear cut decision about who should be seen as the legitimate authorities here. But they face huge constraints, firstly, in terms of the humanitarian crisis, the scale of brutality, that is used against people who live in areas that are controlled by the resistance. And secondly, in terms of capacity constraints and resources. So as a practical first step, I propose we take the, we take the, the proposal from the EROs and the NUG for an inclusive platform for humanitarian engagement. We should take this proposal very seriously. We should do what we can to move it forward. And frankly, we should, we should make sure that all stakeholders see that as a legitimate proposal on the table. And if they want to reject it because of their allegiances to the junta or because of their genuine concerns about the sovereignty of the country of Myanmar or other legitimate concerns that countries might have for different parts of different policies, it's high time that they have to come forward and make those concerns known. We cannot keep going on with ASEAN trying to deliver aid through this top-down structure through the junta and nobody talking directly or openly about what the challenges are, nobody talking directly or openly about why it's politically difficult to do this or that at this time. 
And instead, we just sort of accept, oh, well, without UN Security Council veto, we can't do that. Or without Thailand taking a different stance, we can't do this. We need to get to a point where there is a serious proposal on the table. And if a million refugees flee across the border tomorrow, we need to make sure we're not in a situation where we say, well, we would have proposed something to give aid to them, but politically it wasn't very viable and it didn't all add up and it all seemed a bit difficult and complex. So basically we didn't even propose anything. We need to be in a situation where at the very least if refugees start fleeing across those borders, that we can say, well, we proposed something and the junta rejected it and maybe even other stakeholders blocked it. And if other stakeholders blocked it, then there needs to be a level of checks and balances and a level of accountability for those states that blocked the very reasonable humanitarian proposal that was on the table. So for now, strategically, we need to back that proposal. We need to bring it to life. We need to make it clear this is a reasonable, viable proposal that could be implemented. And from there, we need to continue to um, try to build the legitimacy of those kinds of options and build the legitimacy of the authorities that are willing to lead them and are trying their best to find a way forward. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jolliffe. Um, there's, a, there's a clear call for direct support to the legitimate uh, players in the country, such as uh, NUCC and NUG and the ethnic armed organizations. I have uh, one or two questions on this, and then I open the floor to, to colleagues. So um, uh, how would you describe relations between the NUG and the ethnic armed organizations? Are there any um, blocking uh, issues that need to be solved? Um, before they can uh, truly cooperate for a new democratic Myanmar without the military. And um, it seems that the ethnic armed organizations have never really been capable of uniting in a common front to fight against the Myanmar military. Uh, mm. If this, if you, if, you, if, if you agree, why do you think that is so? Do you think that could change now? Yeah, great, great questions. Thanks. So, yeah, I think that the the level of cooperation and unity, as it were, that we're seeing today is um, extremely unprecedented and high. And I think that this has come into focus at a time where it's obvious that there are still frag there's still differences and there's still a lot of fragmentation. But if you compare it to any point in the past, or especially in recent history, the extent of cooperation along many, many fronts is completely unprecedented. Um, and as I said before, the, the interesting thing about this area of cooperation is it's not just a group of like-minded individuals in the jungle somewhere forming a new set of armed units. This is happening countrywide because of social media and the way that it's being communicated. So for the first time ever, you've even got public protests with the names of different EROs on their banners alongside NUG and all of these things going on across the country. Um, and yeah, that, that kind of level of cooperation is reflected in the bilateral relations between lots of stakeholders. And then to some extent through the NUCC and the other public fora for cooperation. Um, but yeah, absolutely, there's a huge number of, of remaining attention, should we say, or differences, differences in background. You know, I've been asked a lot of times to give briefings to different parts of the NUG and, and others on federalism, on the history of the EROs, on these kinds of topics, because a lot of people are trying to go through a crash course in you know who are these guys are you know what's their struggle been about in the past um and you know what is federalism basically and what does that mean um so i'm hugely encouraged by the kind of progress i've seen in a very short space of time 
And to borrow a, you know, a concept from political science is essentially a critical juncture where all of the old relationships, all of the old institutions are off. Overnight, everything is thrown into chaos. So there's this like potential for lots of new synapses to be formed and new connections to be, to be made. And suddenly lots of new types of um, kind of political systems and ideologies are popping up. So no, it's incredible to see the level of, of cooperation is, is really unprecedented. Um, but yeah, we're, we're coming from a situation where a lot of these people feel like they're from different countries. You know, people who grew up in the ethnic territories across the country, which are not just small territories on the borders, they're mountainous areas all the way through Mon State into southern Nepidor, all the way through Shan State, close to Mandalay. You know, there's entire kind of parallel societies where people have been very dislocated from the valleys for centuries and have been quite dislocated from the Myanmar state since independence. So, yeah, for many people, it's like they're negotiating with other countries. So there's a huge amount of there's differences to bridge. Um, but no, personally, for me, I think the, the most cooperation come has so far come from a common enemy and a unity of purpose more than a unity of thinking and a unity of ideas, much less so from any kind of centralized command structure. And trust me, if any single leader of any ethnicity had tried to form a centralized top-down movement in February 2021, they would have failed immediately, ideologically, and they would not have gained participation. The strength of this movement has been its decentralization and its diversity, and the fact that there's so many leaders of all different backgrounds, like those that you've had the honor to speak at this event today, and so many others across the country. In Burmese, they say, which means anyone can be a leader. And that is the kind of spirit of this revolution. Um, and that's been a strength. Militarily, if one big army had formed in one place, they would have been wiped out immediately just like armed insurgencies, terrorist movements, and nonviolent social movements everywhere, decentralization has been a strength. Nonetheless, at some point to get to another phase, there needs to be increased cohesion, increased coordination, and increased strategy. And for me, I think that won't come from a single unified command structure or political system but it will come from stronger institutions that are delineating power better and delineating how power is being shared so that the NUCC's mandate is clear and there are certain things that are agreed at the NUCC that you know, are, nobody can dis disagree with. There's certain things that are the executive functions of the NUG, which for a set term, are the dis executive decisions of the NUG that people have to accept. And then there's other things that are delegated to the state level or to the specific local levels where those organizations have the autonomy to make those decisions. The more that can be delineated clearly, I think the more everybody can keep on the same page without having to be some kind of all holding hands together, thinking the same, eating the same, believing the same because that frankly is not realistic, but, but I think there's a huge amount of work going into trying to build those kinds of institutional foundations that would be the foundations for a federal system that keep the country together and keep everyone in the same direction without sort of this kind of um, pyramidical structure that, that no one will accept. Uh, since um, you have um, experience of uh, training of different kinds of um, resistance and civil society organizations, local groups in Myanmar, um, where do you see um, governance capacity with a view to a new emerging Myanmar free of the military? Mm. I, I, d I definitely did not see it after 2010 uh, in the military. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, I think, um, do you mean, sorry, do you mean like where does government's capacity lie, essentially? 
Or what is there going to be? Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. I was muted. No, no, no. I asked because um, uh, there have been some hints even today that uh, some of the ethnic uh, organizations might already have the capacity of governance, but perhaps there is more than that. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. So I think that um, there's a huge amount of governance capacity among the resistance movement, especially the ethnic resistance organizations. Um, yeah, I mean, they've had their own governance systems and law books going back decades in many cases. A lot of them are, are based on the British system and have kind of spawned off where the Myanmar state spawned off since the 40s and have kind of gone in their own direction. So the KNU has four, you know, codes of law. The Kareni have a very similar system, most of which are the English common law system. Some of the other ethnic groups based on the Chinese communist system. And then some of them are kind of loosely based on the Myanmar government system that were formed later. Um, but yeah, they certainly have a lot of capacity. Generally, they've been much more effective than the Myanmar state at integrating with community level services. So a huge amount of social capital exists at the community level. Um, you know, a lot of school funding, um, even in government controlled areas, more than 50% of school funding has come from community level donations and raising at that level. The, the EROs have generally been much better at integrating with those. So yeah, they, they provide education to hundreds of thousands of students collectively. You know, they, they've had um, F, uh, healthcare systems. You know, I was recently at the KNU Central Hospital. They've got their cold chain running. Their, de their demand for vaccines is nowhere near met. Um, they, they, they need more vaccines. They've only been able to vaccinate 5% of their target population, um, but they've got the cold chain and everything set up. Um, they provide justice services. Um, you know, there's, there's a, huge, a huge number of, of services they, they provide. And generally they're much more integrated, A, with the kind of local indigenous governance systems and customary systems. Um, but also with that village village level. Um, but then on top of that, now you've got hundreds of thousands of CDM, uh, civil disobedience movement, civil servants, that bring a whole host of other skills. So those include a lot of doctors, huge numbers, probably the majority of CDM workers are from the health sector, and very, very high numbers are from the education sector. So even in the NUG controlled areas or the PDF controlled areas in Sakaing and Maguay, they've been doing mobile healthcare services. They've also got their telehealth system, which is run by some pretty amazing organizations, including people who've worked for international agencies for decades. They're doing telehealth. And then they've also got doctors on the ground with backpacks. They've also been opening schools. Um, so they've had thousands of students sit their matriculation exams in PDF territories. Um, so yeah, you know, the, also the, the ethnic systems, the demand has, has more than doubled. The number of ch children who've enrolled in schools, but also the numbers of people who are coming to their clinics um, and bringing uh, justice cases to them has grown up, gone up astronomically because of the collapse of the central state. Um, so, yeah, and the, you know, in a lot of these ethnic areas, the military is completely in retreat. I can't emphasize how much space there is for the resistance to move into those areas. And they just, they're just trying to keep up. And in some cases, their civilian wings are trying to keep up with the military wings because the military can just steamroll through and take these bases, but the civilian wings don't have the capacity to immediately follow up with governance. So there's a real need for backing those civilian wings, especially backing the women, you know, and backing the civil servants, backing the protesters, these people who are a core part of the resistance movement. We need to back them to build a strong civil sector, you know, to not allow this revolution to just be taken over by the military side and just be taken over by the guys with guns. It need, we need to 
you know, strengthen and, and help build the capacity of the, the civilian wings. And, and the governance capacity is a, is a really important way of doing that. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Mercy Barrens, my colleague, to take the floor now. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Kim Chalifi, for your uh, uh, very good explanations. As a researcher, uh, you give us many informations about the situations of Myanmar. Uh, based on your description before, uh, it's very interesting that you say uh, that it is not about win or lose, but it's about phase of transition towards a just and equal democracy for Myanmar people. So um, in existing conditions, as far as we knew that uh, various processes have been carried out, but were rejected or reluctant uh, by on, 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 yeah, on, on main line and military junta. So, uh, I want to get your uh, perspective or insights about the soft strategy and whether soft strategy or hard strategy, because all the soft strategy like advocacy, lobbying to Asian international organization like UN body, et cetera, all we have done and on progress until now, uh, shape the um, public opinion in the of various uh, media platforms to increase the global awareness about the human rights situation in Myanmar. So uh, could you please give us, yeah, it's, it, it is like a, a crazy question or out of the box questions about the hard strategy, whatever. Because in, uh, as we know that uh, US, uh, um, sorry, uh, Russia, Ukraine, now many countries like Europe countries, US, uh, sent many, many uh, assistance, uh, arm assistance or money, uh, whatever, etc. So what do you think about the heart and uh, especially because soft, uh, soft strategy and various activities all have done until now, uh, we need to explore the heart uh, strategy now. And what about uh, your suggestion about the hard strategy? Uh, is it uh, effective uh, to be done right now in a Myanmar process? And uh, can you describe uh, what kind of hard uh, strategy could be done in Myanmar as long as uh, give a less impact for the Myanmar uh, people? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's it, it's difficult to say. Um, I, I think so. I think here's here's where I would start. I think the most important thing is for the international narrative and perspective to shift to catch up with the situation on the ground. So that doesn't mean pushing the situation on the, on the ground further. That doesn't mean amping up the resistance or pushing things further. That's not the way we should look at a hard strategy. We should be thinking about how do we make sure that the international community is up to speed with the, the scale of, of things on the ground. And by that, what I mean is that much of the, much of the way that the UN and the intergovernmental agencies and ASEAN and other stakeholders are, are talking about the country, and trying to approach the country is based on this idea that the Myanmar military uh, are the de facto authorities. And, you know, we have to negotiate with them as a stakeholder and as the main stakeholder, and we need to persuade them to negotiate with the other groups and stuff like that. There's an alternative way of looking at the country, which is, first of all, that legally other actors are the state of Myanmar. Um, increasingly, from a legit, from a legal point of view, both from the mandate from the 2020 constitution and also from the customary systems and other mandates that, you know, these alternative territories that have never been conquered by the central state of Myanmar since independence hold other forms of legitimacy. And I think we need to start thinking more and more about Okay, so we need to respect the sovereignty of Myanmar. We don't do things without the invite of the sovereignty of the Myanmar. 
But who do we consider to be the representatives of the will of the country? Who do we consider to be the representatives, the, you know, the duty bearers of the state of Myanmar? And I think that's kind of where there's a shift. That means we can then start to look at the problem quite differently and the narratives can start shifting. I think that's a really important first step. Um, and, you know, partly that's about formal processes of, of recognition, like credentials committees and who gets invited to meetings and things like that, I think. But yeah, I think that second part is the practical engagement. Who, who do you engage with to solve problems? You know, I think there have already been some migration cases where the EROs have been engaged on the basis that the EROs clearly control big chunks of the border. I think more and more we need to create space for pragmatic engagement and de facto recognition of those groups. Um, so I think sometimes the question about should we send weapons or should we do this or that, it's a little bit abstract. You know, it's not about those specific shipments of this or that. It's about how do we lead a conversation and how do we start shifting a narrative so that those are the guys who are considered that we, you know, we, we, we recognize as, as the duty bearers of the state increasingly, or at the very least, as we recognize them as some kind of legitimate interim authority that until there is a new constitution and a democratic transition, we recognize them as the duty bearers, the guardians of those rights. I, I mean, I think that's where, where it should start from and that's how we should be talking about it publicly and how we should be thinking about each of these challenges as they come up, um, rather than jumping to kind of, should we send them arms or not, which is somehow the, how the activists frame it. It's, it's not, the frame of reference we need to start with. Thank you. And this has all been very interesting. And I, I'd still like to give the possibility for our two previous um, speakers to comment, um, especially on what um, you uh, have said on, uh, on KNU and Karenni, or if there's anything else. So could I check if um, uh, Sota Domo is still available for a comment? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to give comment and suggestions that this kind of um, uh, kind of event is quite important and also bringing uh, understanding to the internationally, especially API and also ASEAN. Uh, parliamentary human, uh, human rights. So that's this very good that I appreciate that uh, setting up that one. And also at the same time, I would like to convey this message, please to the respected government and to seriously thinking about, I just want to want to meet about whether kick SEC out from the ASEAN or as usual, I, I more would like to the, seriously the international community to think about how should we collectively solve that problem together. That is the, the key. Otherwise, expose all the crisis around in, in the region and also go beyond the region. So that is my final comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Lewis, do you want to take the floor for a comment? Uh, for me, I, I don't have uh, any comment. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. So um, now we have heard our three witnesses of today. Heidi, uh, Heidi I, I have yeah, a yeah. question. Yeah, I, I saw it. Yes. Yeah. Charles, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, my question is to Mr. Kim. Uh, thanks for that very interesting presentation on how the Myanmar military is losing ground. Uh, but I must say, you are one of the very few people who speak confidently uh, that, you know, the Myanmar military is losing out and uh, the other agencies are doing much better, meaning the uh, uh, ET EROs and EAOs and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the impression that you get, even talking to Myanmar's dissidents, 
uh, is one that yes, uh, there is you know some uh, a loss in space. Uh, the sort of uh, uh, the army, uh, army, army, uh, army soldiers, uh, soldiers are leaving the army. You, you have all of that, but it, it doesn't add up to the fact that there is an alternative body to take over. Uh, your story is very, very strong, very confident that you know the army is not there anymore, and the international community must come to terms with it. But you're the only one, very really few people, who make that argument because even the decisions themselves don't agree with each other, and that is why they can't agree whether it is NUG, NUCC, or somebody else. What do you think? Yeah, thank you. Very good point. So yeah, I, I, I take, I totally take your point. Um, I think that, um, so I think that the, the opinion is shifting. I think that, that there's, you know, a year ago, it wasn't even considered one of the scenarios that was worth talking about. I think there has been a huge amount of fatalism from the beginning, um, particularly among the international community, but also among some of the, uh, especially older, there's a slightly generational thing, but it's not exclusively about that. Um, academics and scholars from the, in the country and from a lot of the kind of established advisors to the diplomatic community um, and a good segment of the media kind of, oh, it's so nice, it's so admirable what these people are doing. It's, they're such good people, but it's so sad that the junta has taken back control once again, Myanmar is a military world state. Oh, it's very sad. And I think a lot of people are really struck in that, in that reference. Um, but over the last few months, that's definitely started to shift. Um, you've seen a lot more analysis coming out, you know, ex demonstrating the idea that, that this could go the other way. So uh, the Wilson Center, like Koye Myohane and his colleagues, have done some amazing reports where they've catalogued, you know, the number of resistance fighters. Ye Myo Hain was, is probably the, after Myo, Mong Ong Myo is probably the leading scholar of the Myanmar military in the country. And he's, you know, been really firmly documenting the scale of the resistance and it is pushed in that direction. You then had Anthony Davis, who's a kind of foreign scholar who's been writing articles on the military. And he, he shifted much more to a position of the resistance could win. There's a good chance we're, he says, we're entering this period of strategic equilibrium. So it's more like, it's not just a guerrilla force against a big military. It's this kind of equilibrium that could be a very protracted period. Um, so it, it's definitely shifting a bit. I mean, even ICG. So, I mean, and I'm not gonna, I've got friends that, you know, and I've known people who've done good work for ICG and so on, the International Crisis Group. But they've, you know, been extremely, um, let's say, pessimistic or kind of really focused on, well, the junta's in power, therefore we just have to negotiate, we just have to keep funding oil and gas, we just have to keep, you know, doing our best through diplomacy. Um, but even there, you know, they've kind of started dropping in sentences into their analysis about the existential pressure that the military is under. But they're still kind of stuck in something of a kind of, honestly, I think it's a bit of a kind of postmodern kind of, oh, well, we all know that there aren't really revolutions. We all know that the Myanmar military is always going to win. And even if there was a revolution, probably the resistance would just fight each other. And, oh, there's so much ethnic disunity. It would be even worse without the military. There's all these kinds of tropes that permeate the discourse. And I really just think they're not, they're not looking at the facts of the scale of resistance and the trajectory. The Myanmar military has not, the only strategic victories the Myanmar military has made have been in the cities where they have managed to do some quite big sweeps of the underground guerrilla movements. In a couple of cases, they've caught leaders and they've arrested a hundred or so fighters. In basically every other measure, they are losing at a rate that we've never seen. Um, these kinds of 
losses have just never been seen since the 1940s. So yeah, we, 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 nothing's guaranteed, but I think all of the facts speak for the, for the reality that we are entering a very, a potentially a protracted period of civil war in which there's a serious, significant territory under the control of resistant forces. And given that the SAC has not reversed anything so far, it, it is very hard to see them gaining the strategic initiative again and reversing it back. Um, but yeah, there are a huge number of risks about what comes next if we don't invest in the political systems of the opposition, if we don't make sure that, you know, the, the civilian leaders remain the center of this movement, then there are risks of for state failure, of different stakeholders, you know, different resistance actors fighting each other. Um, but but this the, the, the scenario of the Myanmar military becoming the supreme institution again, that controls the whole country is barely a scenario that's, that's even realistically thinking about at this point. I just have a, a, Heidi, a follow up, very short follow up question. Why did the Myanmar junta decide to execute for the activists, including parliamentarians and prominent people? What was the logic behind this? Uh, you know, the week before that, uh, you had the uh, special envoy, Cambodian special envoy, who visited. Week after the execution, you had the um, ASEAN foreign ministers having a meeting uh, in Phnom Penh. So why why do do you know, execute people at, at critical juncture? Uh, why could why execute at all? What was the message that you were trying to send? Yeah, I think it's the only language that they know and the only kind of tool that they have in their toolbox is violence and fear. Um, their entire gambit from day one of the coup was, we will go further than you would. And so that's why there's been this escalatory nature of the conflict since the beginning. You know, the on day one, you thought maybe in the morning, oh, they'll pull back at some point soon. This is a play. And then they're going to settle for a much better kind of coalition with the democratic forces. By the night of the 2nd of February, there was no way that that was happening. They would already put criminal charges on Aung San Suu Kyi and had locked her up without, you know. My point is that they just always go to the next extreme because they feel like that's their way of keeping the initiative, is we are gonna go one step further than you thought we were. Don't you test us? And quite simply, violence and um, doing things that are morally outrageous as the strategy is one of their major tools that they, they know from their approach to psychological warfare, and that's how they are in the villages. That's why people are so distrusting and why there's so many stories of extreme human rights abuse that for a long time people didn't believe them because you think, why would they do this? Why would, why would they burn women in that way? Or why would they throw babies on fire? Or why would they do these things? And it just seems to be at the core of, of the way that they, they operate is, we will go a step further than you think we're going to. And if you don't submit, don't test how far we'll go next. And I think that's the kind of rationale that is a, at the center of, of their move to, to execute those prisoners. Um, I think the other factor is just that they're in their own bubble. They do not listen to the outside world. They feel like they're in the trenches fighting against the colonial you know, invaders still, that's their, that's their psyche, that's their doctrine. And they don't listen to anything that comes from outside of their own military clique. And they take criticism as a sign that, oh, this is another enemy. And I think they really just dig their heels in and they, they, they wanna show everyone that their logic is the right logic and, and they just live in a completely different planet. Um, and so they, so they don't hear the things that we think are rational. They just don't hear them.
Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, so one last question on Tatmadaw. Do you see um, any way uh, that the Tatmadaw leadership would leave power? And uh, how could one encourage such a development? And, and as a side note, uh, does the uh, Tatmadaw still rely on uh, astrologers? Good question. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think one of the problems is um, is that we don't we don't have access to enough inside information to to know the day to day workings. So there's always a level of speculation. Um, so yeah, there's certainly a history of the Tamador, you know, listening to astrologers, and they certainly have, you know. You can see from their communications in state media and you know what is communicated to their soldiers and what we hear from defectors, there are a lot of themes in their own kind of internal messaging and their own ideology. And it's very, very strong. It's not like they're just some kind of, you know, ragtag force that kind of have ended up abusing because of rogue units or anything like that. They are an extremely strong institution they have a very deeply embedded culture of their own as i mentioned before with five you know five universities the, the, the reams and reams of, of masters theses that have been written internally and then this whole kind of psychological warfare approach and all of the training that goes on down through the ranks um, and i think that's taken on a, a lot more influence from Buddhist nationalism as well, from Tan Shui era, late 80s and 90s, but then increasingly under Min Aung Hlaing. And um, you get the feeling that Min Aung Hlaing is quite a good manager in the sense that he's able to keep everything ticking along. Um, and he's able to maintain sort of the respect of his peers and preempt any kind of internal division and through that he's able to kind of manage the institution very effectively and that's how he's managed to keep his position in a way that you know we don't see in other coups around the world we don't see this level of integrity within the institution they always start splitting so I think a lot of that is and then but I think he's not a visionary politically I don't think he has big ideas even Dane saying you know in many ways was a, was a Myanmar military man, but he had big ideas about the politics of the country and the direction he was trying to go in. Um, Min Hlaing doesn't seem to have those big ideas and increasingly has kind of dug into this, a mixture of this kind of traditional guardian ideology. We are the Tamador, we have to hold the country together. The Muslims are trying to divide us. The West are trying to divide us. All of the ethnic groups are trying to divide us and they're just stooges of these foreign elements that are trying to divide us and more and more has, has taken on this kind of extreme buddhist nationalism that that specifically targets but muslims but also you know continues these quite chauvinistic policies against women um, especially and so all of these kinds of things seem to kind of bubble up into some kind of ideology. And in terms of astrologers specifically, I, I don't know the details. You, you hear those hearsay things about when they've seen an astrologer, which I think are very believable. I think not only the Tamador, I think a lot of people across Southeast Asia and particularly in Myanmar do use astrologers. Um, so I think it's very plausible that it's it's part of, of their decision-making, um, but I, but I don't know to what extent um, that specifically is one today, but it's definitely, I'm sure, part of, of what they do. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kim uh, Jolliffe. Um, by the way, I, I checked, uh, meanwhile, your, your Twitter account, but you seem to have a lot of uh, bots after you because there are many on your name which have zero followers and, and all or they have some of my followers, which is at the moment unlikely. So um, 
but uh, we definitely want to follow you and all the other speakers that the two others um, as well. So um, now I think it's time to close uh, this hearing with the, the three uh, outstanding witnesses and uh, the rest of us will move to a more internal part and uh,